This episode will be getting a quad rendered on the screen. When we later add a texture to one of these quads, suddenly it's a sprite. I just want to preface this episode by saying that because we're not going to be adding shaders in this episode, it's possible that your GPU may not draw anything to the screen. If you're absolutely sure that all the code is correct and it's not drawing, then don't worry. Next episode, we'll be adding shaders and it should show up fine. But for most setups, you should still see something even without a shader. But before we get to that, let's start the process of code organization nice and early. Create an engine directory inside source and a render directory inside engine. However you want to make new directories and files is up to you. I'll just create directories using the Windows Explorer for the sake of demonstration. There's a few type defs that I would like to use in my projects. This is optional. If you want to follow along exactly, then create a types.h file inside engine. We'll use include guards extensively in this engine. Essentially what happens when you include a header file is the compiler just copies the header file directly into the place where you wrote the include directive. That means you'll end up with a multiple definition error as soon as you include a header in two places. To get around this, start every header file with an if ifndef directive that says, hey, if this types underscore h is not yet defined, then include everything until the end if. Then immediately define an empty constant types underscore h. Now after the first time the header types h is included, it won't be included again. In this types.h file, we're going to want to include int types.h. If you haven't used type def before, it just tells the compiler to look for the left type when it sees your defined type on the right. We'll just sub the unsigned and signed integers, float and double. Now this next part isn't in the original source code, but I saw something similar in a recent video on YouTube by JDH, and I had to adopt it. In the engine directory, create a util.h file. Rather than typing printf and then some error message and exit or return every time, we can create a couple of quick macros. Macros in C are straight up text substitutions that happen before compile time, similar to how the headers are copied. Anywhere this macro is used, we'll have the definition copied into the source code before compilation. We're now going to create our first, what I call module. So inside the render directory, we're going to create a few files and then I'll explain what they're for. We'll need render.c, render underscore init.c, render.h, and render underscore internal.h. Don't worry, we're not going to have a million header files, just two for each module generally. How I like to structure the modules is as such. Render.h is where all the functions and types that will be used in other areas of the code are defined. Then render underscore internal dot h is where all the functions and types that are strictly internal to the render module are defined. This way, when you include render dot h, you don't get a bunch of garbage in your autocomplete. If you need to move something outside the module that's internal, you can just move it to the other header file. I learned this type of organization from Eskil Steenberg's How I Program in C video on YouTube. Next up, we're going to create somewhere to store our global state. If you learned programming at university or if you're a web developer like I was, they probably taught you some dogma about never using global state. That's kind of nonsense. Just don't be dogmatic about it. Find to use any technique when it suits the problem at hand. Passing around data between many functions in one update is just going to cause maintainability problems and slower execution. We will, however, try to keep things a bit organized, so we're not just going to stick everything into global state. For now, just create a global.c and a global.h file in the engine directory. Let's actually open up a file and begin. Open up global.h. Just assume that every header file has an include guard unless I say otherwise. And here we'll include the render.h file we just created, after which we'll define our global struct. This is going to be an extern variable. That means it's declared here, but has no memory assigned with it yet. Once we define it in another file elsewhere, this symbol will be associated with that memory. So then we can include this header file and access the variable from anywhere. Hence, global. Now open up global.c and then define the global variable in here. Let's head over to render.h and define this type. The things you want to be global from the render module are appointed to the window object and the width and height of the window. While we're here, we'll define a few function prototypes. Render underscore init with no parameters. Render underscore begin with no parameters. Render underscore end with no parameters. And render underscore quad that takes three parameters. A vector two for the position, a vector two for the size, and a vector four for the color. Now we don't have these vector types in the project at the moment. So for that, we'll go and grab the linmath.h library from Dutton Wolf on GitHub. Now I use this rather than CGLM, partially due to legacy as I found linmath first, and partially because the installation is super easy. Just add this one file to your include directory and you are done. 
copy the function prototypes from render.h into render.c and we can start filling them out. Before that, we'll create a state variable here of a type we have yet to define. This state variable will hold any internal state that we need to share inside the render module. Inside render underscore init, we'll set the width and height. Then we'll call a function that we haven't made yet and assign that to the global window. Render underscore init underscore window takes a width and a height. Lastly, we'll call another function that we haven't defined yet, render init quad. This takes three arguments. They're all pointers to unsigned 32-bit integers. I'll briefly explain the difference between VAOs, VBOs, and EBOs when we fill out this function. Moving on to render begin, we'll first set the clear color. Basically the background color of the window before we draw anything. Then we'll just clear the color buffer. There's actually three buffers that make up what you see drawn, the color, depth, and stencil buffers. For now, we'll just clear the color buffer. All right, that's done. And in render end, we'll just need to call an SDL function. SDL GL swap window. Pass in the global window pointer and this function is done. Lastly, let's fill out the render quad function. First, we'll bind the VAO, which I'll explain shortly. Then we'll call draw elements. This is just telling OpenGL that we want to draw something made from triangles that has six elements. To show what I'm talking about, we can add a call to the GL polygon mode function and set it to draw GL lines. Finally, we'll just unbind the VAO. This is not actually necessary, but you may inadvertently change some state on the VAO in another place if you don't unbind it first. Let's head into render underscore internal dot H to define the types and functions that the render module will use internally. We know that we need render state internal, and at the moment it has three U32s, VAO quad, VBO quad, and EBO quad. As well as that, we have the render init window function from earlier and render init quad. For render init window, we'll just copy this code directly from main. Let's replace the printf and error lines with our macro we created earlier. And we'll just return the window pointer from this function. Now for setting up quad rendering. If you've read the learnopengl.com getting started chapter, this will all be very familiar. We need some vertices that describe a quad. In our case, we want the origin of the quad to be the center. Some game or rendering engines will use the bottom left or top left corners, but we're gonna stick with the center. Since we're using the center, that means each vertex will sit at 0.5 or negative 0.5. There's three more coordinates in this array. The third is the Z axis, and that can be used for depth. We'll set that to zero by default. Then we have something called UV coordinates. These are telling OpenGL how to map a texture onto the quad. This will be useful later. Just copy what I have here for now. Next up, we need indices. Remember how I said that a quad is actually two triangles? This array is telling OpenGL in which order the vertices make up the triangles. Now we'll generate the vertex array and buffers that we need to store this data in. I like to think of VAOs as a preset. They basically tell OpenGL, hey, when I bind this preset, I want you to point to this data and use it. And the data is whatever VBO and or EBO buffers you specify. VBOs and EBOs are just arrays of data. As OpenGL is a state machine, it can only access the currently bound arrays and buffers. So if you want to update the data in a particular buffer, it must be bound. Here we just copy the vertices array into the VBO and the indices array into the EBO. Now we need to tell OpenGL how to read the data that we just put into the vertex buffer. We can do that by using the GL vertex attrib pointer function. It looks a bit complicated, but let's go through each argument. The zero refers to the attribute index. In this case, we've got two, so we've got a zero and a one. Three refers to how many elements. In our case, x, y, z is three. GL underscore float is the type. GL underscore false is whether OpenGL needs to normalize the float. We don't need that. Five times size of F32 is something called the stride. Easiest way to think about it is how many elements do you need to move from the first X to get to the next X? So up in the vertices array, you can see we've got 0.5, 0.5, three zeros, and then another 0.5. The way I've laid it out makes it very easy, but if you just count the columns, you've got five. So you need to move five spaces or five floats from the first one to get to the next one of the same type. Lastly, there's an offset. Null means no offset. Then as you can see for UVs, we actually start at basically three times the size of a float. And that's because there's the X, the Y, and the Z that are all stored before the first UV. The offset is to the beginning of the first one. You have to cast it to a void pointer. Now finally, we'll unbind this VAO. All right, it's finally time to update the main.c file. Back in main, just uh, put in render begin. I'm gonna render a little test quad here. We'll put in some values, although a lot of these won't be respected at the minute. 
and then we'll put in a render end. At the beginning of the function, we need render init, and then we need to include the correct header files. We'll also need to go into our build.bat, just add all of the C files that we created today into the files list. If everything went well, upon completion, you should have a white box that's exactly 50% of the size of the window. That's because of the way screen coordinates work. They go from negative one to one, which means our quad with a size of 0.5 plus 0.5 is gonna make up half of that space. 